afternoon, wherever you are in the world, uh, and welcome to this talk on uh, Ankles uh, Ultrasound. This is a more advanced um, uh, talk on uh, ankle scans, what did I miss? Uh, so some of the, the more tricky uh, elements of the scan that can be uh, missed easily. So sit back and enjoy, and I hope you do, and I look forward to uh, hearing your questions as well. Thanks very much. Well, good afternoon or good morning uh, to this talk, wherever you're from. Uh, my name is Andrew Graham, and I'm presenting this uh, talk from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, so the talk today is on uh, ankle ultrasound, what did I miss? So uh, my profile is I trained as a physiotherapist here in New Zealand, went on to work in the United States as a, uh, a physical therapist in Texas. I have come back and I've done a postgraduate sports medicine diploma, went on to study uh, diagnostic ultrasound, completing a postgraduate diploma, and also completing postgraduate qualifications in uh, interventional techniques. So I just want to acknowledge the European Society for Musculoskeletal Radiology. They have produced uh, these great worksheets uh, for musculoskeletal ultrasound techniques. Uh, and the one that they've done for the ankle is well worth um, reviewing. There you will see the basics of uh, ankle ultrasound. The purpose of this talk today is it's a little bit more of an advanced uh, course. We're going to be looking at some of the things that are easily missed on ultrasound uh, and some of the clinical um, testing that we can do to help us come to a better conclusion as to what injury we've actually found in and around the ankle region. So this European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology, you can Google those, and they are very, very good resources to do the very basic scans. So ankle sprains are very common, about one sprain uh, per 100,000 population daily. Uh, females more than uh, males, and children more than adolescents, um, and then adolescents more than adults. When we look at the recovery of a, an ankle sprain, these happen, this, this graph I'm going to show you in these following graphs can be used for uh, many different injury types and many different uh, situations. So this is a really good uh, resource to have for your clinic when explaining injury recovery. When we say to someone it takes six to eight weeks or six months or nine to 12 months, patients get in their mind that it's a linear recovery. But in actual fact, we see that the recovery is somewhat like this, where we go through a period of improvement and then we're static and we go through another period of improvement and then it's static and then a final period. The, even that is not linear, you'll see in the um, bottom of the, the graph, that in actual fact, we have good days and bad days, good days and bad days, good days, bad days. And that will depend on what we've done. The first time we walk on an injury, we may feel good, but the next day it may be sore. The next time we walk up a hill, it will be uh, it will feel good about doing that, but the next day it will be sore. The first time we run, the first time we walk on a beach, on uneven surface, on rocks. Uh, and so this is quite an important um, graph to, to be able to show patients. You as the sonographer, you as the clinician, the POCUS clinician, it may be an ED, you may be the only one that has the ability to explain these things to the patient. So we include this today for your benefit in this talk. So we can see again at that stage, this may be the stage that you walk, but there's still improvement to go. Then they may return to work, return to sports training, return to sport. And indeed, some people we even have to tell them that uh, returning to sport may not be possible. Uh, another important um, aspect I like to find, particularly with ankle scans, is knowing the Baton scale. So the Baton scale are five tests that we can do for hypermobility syndrome. We're finding more and more people presenting with uh, these conditions, uh, sprained ankle with not really a high-grade um, activity that's caused or a high-grade injury, 
and they come in and they present with hyperflexibility or they present with um, a positive anterior draw test is positive when in fact they're just hypermobile. And these tests are as follows. In the finger, can the finger go beyond 90? The thumb coming to the forearm, hyperextension beyond 10 degrees of wrist extension uh, at the foot, metatarsophalangeal, MTP. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, being able to uh, flex forward and put the hands on the floor. This is a really, really good uh, slide. When we look at injuries, 70% of what we suspect the injury to be will come from the history. That's very, very important that we take a history. Uh, many times in imaging, we're just told to take a picture uh, and get on with the job. But in actual fact, the history is very, very important. How did they do this? What is the time frame? How long has it been since the injury? Then the clinical tests, even though we may not perform many, if you're in an ED setting, if you're in a sports medicine setting, traveling with teams, you need to know the basic clinical tests. These will help you come to a diagnosis and imaging is 10% of the knowledge that we get. We are there to confirm the injury on the basis of the clinical history and the clinical tests. So as I said, history, takes up about 70% of the knowledge of what we did. Was it a running injury? Was it a fall onto an outstretched hand? Was it a, uh, an, a motor vehicle accident? What was the causative agent to get your patient to where you are now? And here we can see, spraying on, on, a, on a, a trail. Many patients these days have videos. There's videos everywhere for everything. Uh, and this was a patient that brought in the video and said, I stepped on the ball at a video game, but I've got the video. I said, I would love to see it. That would help me out immensely. So here's the video. Just in case you missed it. And in slow motion, this is the arrow indicates the player we're interested. And it does indeed look like the ball was in the vicinity of his injury, but in actual fact, it was next to it. And when he looked at this video, he said to me, yeah, I fell on the ball, but in actual fact, the ball lands next to his foot and he just inverts his ankle. But this gave us a lot of information. So there we can see. Speaking of photos, just a little aside, here's some very interesting things, some photos that uh, other patients have brought in and gone, guess the injury. This was a young lady out running and she's got a shoulder injury. Well, what is that? Anybody got any guesses? Well, she was out running and she tripped and she fell against some roadwork fencing. So you can see she's got the perfect pattern of the fencing on her arm. Here we have got some bruising down in the Achilles. What are we thinking there? And onto her toes. And she indeed had an ankle sprain. Some folks would go, look, she ruptured her Achilles. But this is where the bruising goes. We must remember, and particularly in the, the leg and the foot, bruising and swelling will go to the regions of lowest pressure. So that is the medial and lateral malleolar recesses and into the forefoot, where you can indeed get pitting edema. And then we come to the clinical tests for the ankle, and these are very important. So the Ottawa rules, please, 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 if you have a go home from this talk, it's that 
if they have a weight bearing injury or they, they, and they're unable to weight bear, I should say, please, please follow the Ottawa Anchor Rules to get an X-ray to rule out a fracture. Even though we have this wonderful tool, ultrasound, in our, uh, at our disposal, let's follow the uh, uh, medically correct way of doing things. So Ottawa Rules for those that cannot weight bear, or if they have pain in the lower uh, uh, fibula tibia area. <clears throat> But there's many, many, many tests here. Um, there is a, a book by Bruckner and Kahn. A couple of Australian authors have got a book out, Bruckner and Kahn. It is absolutely a brilliant book for, um, for reviewing all the clinical tests in sports medicine. Remember sports medicine, falling uh, over at home, uh, getting a, a work injury, the mechanisms can be very similar. So just because something says sports medicine doesn't mean that it may not be helpful for you as a clinician. We're going to look today at the anterior drawer test of the ankle. So the anterior drawer is to take your uh, right hand over the um, anterior portion of the lower leg. Your left hand comes underneath. You can do this right and left handed. It's, it's interchangeable. Uh, but you take your left hand under the calcane and you're just very gently drawing together to see how much movement you have, looking at the integrity of predominantly the, the ATFL to a lesser degree the AITFL. Um, with hypermobility, as we talked about, so high Baton score, high, hypermobility, these people and mostly young ladies tend to just keep, seem to keep going forever and ever. They just move on and on. And it's not unusual to get a uh, referral stating a positive anterior draw test. So knowing, and you'll get the feel, I would um, do this test on everybody that comes in, even if you be practicing, if you've got a knee injury or if you've got a foot injury, just practice this test to get the feel of uh, different joint sensations and end fields. Now the most common, we're not going to go into detail on the common injuries because you can do that through the uh, European Society worksheets. But we've got the ATFL. And what does it look like? What does a normal ligament look like? So what we have here is you'll see the fine fibres in the ATFL and they all line up together. We call it the fibrillar echo pattern. Please don't get that confused with the pinnate echo texture, which is what we use for uh, muscles. And if we do the anterior draw test, you're going to see this is the ligament. Um, in this shot, you can see the ligament is nice and straight and taut. That's a nice, healthy ligament. We then come to a ligament that has been injured, and you can see that it's sagging um, a bit like a, um, a deck chair or a hammock that you would see between two trees. And what we're going to see is when we press, you can see the fibers underneath, they start to stretch out. So this has been injured, and if we do it without the cursor. So you'll see the hammock and you'll see the fibers start to straighten out. So this is a partial rupture. We can still see uh, the ligament extending and tightening as the anterior draw test takes place. Can see with the cursor there, you can see how much it moves in relation to the still cursor. And here we go here, you'll see the hammock almost seems to straighten up. So that's what an anterior draw test looks like. And this is what the anterior draw looks like with a completely ruptured. You can't see any fibres at all. The, the, the bones are completely moving independently. You'll see that the um, at the top of the screen with the little green arrow pointing down, you're going to see there that the fibers there are moving actually in the opposite direction to the other side, the other at the fibula end. And this is a complete rupture. We don't see uh, any discernible fibers of the ATFL and the talus is moving quite substantially in relation to the fibula. 
and then we come to 10% imaging. Again, I'm going to hone on on this. Ottawa rules are very, very important. So bony tenderness along the distal 6 centimetres of the posterior edge, edge of the fibula or the tip of the lateral malleolus. Uh, bony tenderness along the distal 6 centimetres of the posterior edge of the fibula or the tip of the medial malleolus. Bony tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal. Bony tenderness at the navicular. Inability to bear weight both immediately after injury and for four steps during the initial evaluation. Please, please, please get an x-ray. We don't want to miss something significant um, because uh, we feel that our imaging, we're very smart and it's very easy to see fractures. Let's make sure we do the best for the patient. Finish this sentence. During the scan, we all know that practice makes Hopefully you've said it out loud and say it out loud in the, in the rooms or the clinics where you are now. Practice makes, and I bet you've all said, practice makes perfect. Did you know that that is wrong? Practice makes permanent. If you continue to do something over and over and over again, the brain elasticity in your, your the neuro pathways, your brain memory will get you doing the same thing in the same way. What's the, uh, the the famous proverb? What is the definition of madness? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, when practice makes perfect, so if you have learned something the, the bad way and that's the way you've continued to do it in practice, uh, and then it's likely not to be correct. Therefore, the correct statement is perfect practice makes perfect. Another clinical point, please, 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 ligaments sprain, muscles and tendons strain. So many times I see clinicians that uh, give a referral for ATF, ATFL strain. Ligaments sprain, muscles and tendons strain. Clinical point, <clears throat> um, we call these grade one, two, three. We are trying to get away from that, uh, that language. Grade one, two, three is the sort of things your basic first aid people uh, are using. Let's use medical terms. Let's line it up with, uh, with MRI. So a mild sprain, a grade one sprain. Uh, you may not have any discernible rupture, but it could be up to 10%. This is the most common and least severe form. The ligaments may be stretched, may be torn, but the ankle is still stable. Then we have a moderate sprain. This is the old terms, the grade um, two. This would be 10 to 50% of ligament sprains. The injury is more severe and painful, and one, of, one or more ligaments may be partially torn. The joint is somewhat unstable, and movement may be limited. Uh, grade twos, we probably need to look at immobilizing uh, these injuries in something like a moon boot. And then we have high grade sprains. These would be called the old grade three. Uh, and these would be 50% or more, but not a complete rupture. So let's say 50 to 90%. Um, technically, 50 to 99 is very hard to discern 1% of fibers. But this is one or more ligaments are torn and the ankle is unstable. Um, and it will be hardly possible to move the foot. There may be lots of swelling at all. And then a full rupture with the significant instability, depending on uh, the activity, uh, an expedited referral to an orthopedic specialist is recommended. Using this grading system, we can say to someone, you have a mild sprain, that may be two to three weeks out of action, uh, a mild sprain, a moderate sprain, three to six weeks, high grade sprain, maybe six to 12, a rupture, maybe season ending, depending on what the results of your orthopedic specialist visit and the conclusions that they came to. That's a, that's a, um, a really nice grading system. To me, it also makes sense. Imagine someone comes to you 
and you're a non-clinical person and they go, oh, I've got a, a grade two sprain. What does that mean? They really don't know. But if they say, they've got, oh, it's a moderate sprain, people, lay people generally tend to have a little bit more of a, of a feeling about what mild, moderate, high-grade sprain and rupture mean. And so I kind of look at it like this, that it's not, you know, it's strictly speaking, a uh, uh, categorization of in boxes, but it's like a rainbow, isn't it, where, where the grades will meld into, into one another. So is it possible to have a low to moderate sprain? Yes, it is. A moderate to high sprain? Absolutely it is. Ruptures tend to be ruptures. But it's just a grading system that allows us a little bit more explanation to the patient on the severity of their injury. So again, the picture on the left, it's not like in boxes, but it's more like the picture on the right, where it melds into uh, lots of different variations. And this is a very good classification from the British Athletic, um, from the uh, British Journal of Medicine. Uh, and again, grade zero could be a muscle soreness as that found in DOMS. And again, two to uh, zero to two weeks. Grade one, small muscle. This is, by the way, this is a muscle tear. This can work for ligaments as well. So this is a very good grading system. So small muscle tears, one to three weeks, a moderate tear, um, extend from the fascia, 10 to 15% cross-sectional area. Very, very good description. Two to four weeks. Um, <clears throat> extensive muscle tears or high grades, four to eight weeks. Complete muscle tears, maybe eight weeks plus two season ending. I think we had a little bit of a conflict there. I think I may have said 12 weeks previously. These are subjective numbers. Um, but you tell a high um, uh, competing athlete eight weeks or 12 weeks, all they know is that's a long time. So it's a very good, good grading system that allows you to be able to tell your patients an approximate recovery time. This is another very, very, very important clinical point scan where the patient points to, where they point their finger to and they say, this is for right here. You, it's, you, you're neglecting your patient if you don't do that. It's very, very important. Um, small focal fractures will be so specific and so focal, you'll be able to, the patient will point to it, you just put your probe on and there you go, you found the fracture or the tear. Don't get into just being a protocol scanner. In other words, this is the protocol we use at our clinic, and that's what I do. Be a clinical sonographer, which means, yes, you know the protocol, you'll follow the protocol, but then you'll extend your scan to where um, the patient points to. Again, just reiterating, the um, European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology, great guidelines. In that, they have well documented the lateral ankle, ATFL, CFL, AITFL syndesmosis, the perineal tendons, the deltoids, avulsion injuries. Um, just don't rely on x-ray. You have to remember we are accurate and our um, uh, resolution can go down to 0.1 of a millimeter. So if you have a periosteal injury and a, and a periosteal avulsion injury, uh, we can see those where sometimes the x-ray is missed. Don't forget our Tom Dick Harry rule in the medial ankle, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and the accessory bones such as the navicular. So the anterior ankle. This is how we scan the anterior ankle. What are we looking for? Well, we've got the tailor down, uh, the tailor here. We've got, uh, we're looking at the anterior tendons. So AITFL, ATFL, CFL, in these positions for the AITFL, we're looking at the syndesmosis. This is a normal AITFL. It's a very thin ligament, and you can see there, looks like a nice, thin, long structure. A TFL, a bit thicker, and you can see the fibrillar echo pattern, the fine lines. It's almost like looking at here. If you look at someone's here, they've got these fine lines, the strands going in one way. This is what these ligaments look like. CFL, CFL, uh, more easily seen. 
when you dorsiflex your foot, the uh, ligament acts a little bit like a sling, pushing the perineus longus and brevis tendons more anteriorly, and you can see the CFL a little bit more clearly. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, the uh, fibular attachment is sometimes hard to see because of an isotrophy. So here we go in the neutral position. And then when we dorsiflex our foot, we can see that we're getting a little bit better view here. So I'm not sure if my mouse is working. Um, a little bit better view of... So the lower picture is dorsiflexion. The upper picture in the neutral uh, where the arrow is pointing to the dark area, which is anisotropy caused by uh, reflection and refraction of the tendon fibers away from the probe. So again, the ATFL, we see these fine, fine structures. This is the, uh, the fibrillar echo pattern of the ligament. Again, the grading system we've been through, I won't go through that too much more. Similar. But here are the grades here. So A, we have a grade one. We see a little bit of uh, dark fluid around the ligament, but the ligament for the most part is intact. Then we've got a uh, grade two, where you can see there in B, picture B, it's significantly thickened. And it now looks like there's dots in the ligament, rather than the lines that's become a bit dotty. C is a high grade where now we start to look at it and say, oh, can't even really see the ligament very clearly. I can see some dots and I can see some lines, but that is a high grade tear with probably 80% of the ligament ruptured or torn. And then in D, we see a complete rupture where we can see the opposing ends abutting and we've got fluid insinuating through the opposing ends. These appearances uh, are also this this particular slide here is very very good to keep uh, as a record because this is goes for knee ligaments and ankle ligaments wristlet this is ligament progression through the whole body these ligaments are a little bit bigger than some but you'll find the medial collateral ligament will go through the same process and look the same uh -huh. that's the basic scan but wait there's more what I want to look at now is a joint effusion, dorsal talon, navicular ligament, bifurcate ligament, pseudotumors, posterior talofibular ligament, and the spring ligament. These uh, are not really well documented in protocols. There's lots of pathology that can be missed here, and you really do need to know about these structures to get a full uh, ankle uh, assessment. So joint effusion. Normally in the anterior joint recess, and you can see here when we move, when we, when we dorsiflex, this is in weight bearing, you can see the fluid moving. Now, why are joint effusions important? Joint effusions are the first thing that come in a significant injury. Well, firstly, it tells us that. It tells us that there is a significant injury. Uh, and so um, it relates to severity. It's the first to come and it's the last thing to go. Swelling is the last thing to go. So what will happen is the patients, if we go back to our chart, <clears throat> if we go back to our, our charts where we had um, <clears throat> the linear in here, so you'll find that folks that come in and they plateau, they often plateau because the swelling in the joints not allowing them to do things. And it goes on, There's, and we have to reassure them that during these times that they've had good imaging early on, that this is just part of the natural progression. And particularly in these cases where we have plateaus, uh, my experience has been that probably 70% of the time we plateau here because they have a, a reasonable joint effusion, which is not allowing them to do a lot of things. <clears throat> and so what does this do? <clears throat> Excuse my humbug, it's early in the morning. Well, what the joint effusion causes is it causes a limitation of particularly dorsiflexion. So patients will often come in as our joint effusion, 
you can see that as we dorsiflex, fluid goes to the area of lowest pressure. Remember that. It's simple physics, and the body responds to simple physics. And so here, again, we've got a consolidated effusion and possibly a hemarthrosis because it's not dark. You can see in this previous one, um, quite a dark, hypoechoic fluid collection there. That's thickening. In the next one, we can see it thickening in there, and you can see the fibers moving, but that's a more consolidated effusion. And that is approximately the point that we are scanning for that effusion. And again, we're coming back to our graph. This is what is responsible often for those plateaus. Swelling not allowing us to start running or start um, activity that we want. And this is an example of someone who has a joint effusion, a quick test. This is the sort of limitation that they have on their right knee. They can get that all the way to the floor, but the left knee they can't bend. When you ask them why, they say their ankle is not allowing them the movement. When you ask them, is it because of pain? They go, no, it's not pain at all. It feels like I've got a block of wood in my ankle. I just can't do it. So non-painless limitation in movement, think joint effusion. And what are the implications? They are responsible for the non-painful stage of limitation where the movement is blocked. And they are also responsible for prolonged recovery. Many years ago, um, surgeons would uh, pop this effusion out and put a steroid in there for healing. Certainly from my perspective, I don't recommend that. Um, that joint effusion is in there for a reason. Uh, we suck that effusion out, put um, a steroid in there. Are we opening up that client to premature arthritis, particularly in younger athletes? Dorso, talonavicular joint and ligament. Uh, this is becoming increasingly more fascinating for me. Um, people will come along and say, I've got pain right at the front there. They'll put, point their finger down and say, that's where I've got the movement. Um, I'm finding 25% of, uh, sorry, that's where they've got the pain. They'll point to that region indicated on this slide and I say, that's where I've got the pain. About 25% of all ankle sprains that I scan have uh, an issue in this region. They'll come in like this and go, this is where I'm sore, the right hand. This is, I'm sore just over here. This is where we're scanning, pro position. And it's the dorsotalonavicular ligament that we're looking at. And this is what it looks like. This is a normal ligament. So you can see here, a normal dorsal talonavicular ligament. History is very important. How are most of these injured? These are injured in a hyper plantar flexed injury with uh, a degree, plus or minus, you could say, uh, inversion. So these are the people uh, that miss the bottom step or their heel hits the bottom step, forces them into over a plantar flexion and they're weight bearing and they go forward and they end up uh, at the bottom of the stairs. Uh, in a pothole, um, dancers get these uh, on their on their toes, injuries where they're on their toes. Football players. Uh, as a little aside, and, and I don't mean to, to, to be rude for a period of time, we had a bunch of young women who were going off to weddings, wearing high heels, uh, having a little bit too much to drink. Uh, and when you ask them, how did you injure your ankle? And during wedding season, we get a few of these. They say, oh, I decided to dance on the table in my high heel shoes and I fell off the table. So there are some good stories. And so here we have an injured talonavicular ligament on the left in the yellow and normal on the right. And there may or may not be a degree of bony irregularity. And in fact, here's one that we've scanned that has got small avulsion uh, fractures of the talus and the navicular in that area. So what are the implications? These are anterior rather than lateral pain. These tend to have ongoing low-grade symptoms. They go on and on for month and month. 
these are the ones that come back for a second opinion. There must be something else going on. Somebody's missed something on an x-ray. Somebody's missed something, and I've still got this pain. Anterior impingement. They, this is a big, big flag uh, for avulsion injury if they have an anterior impingement. What do I mean by that? If they go into a, a deep squat, so hyperdorsiflexion, um, uh, hyper they get pain. And again, remembering, avulsion injuries, particularly of the periosteum, they're less than one millimeter thick, and these are often missed on x-ray. And again, they're responsible for the delay in healings. Bifurcate ligament. This is a very interesting part of the foot. Anatomically, the bifurcate ligament is a, a Y-shaped structure with two bands, the calcio, calcaneo navicular ligament and the calcaneo cuboid ligament. Almost 91% uh, of injuries to the serious sprains of this area are both the calcaneo navicular and the calcaneo cuboid ligament portions. 9% uh, have a calcaneo navicular strain with no calcaneo cuboid, and there, uh, in the the um, research, there's no reported injuries of the an isolated calcaneo cuboid ligament injury. So you can see there are the anterior lateral portion of the joint, and you can see how that these can be uh, mistaken for ATFL with surface uh, anatomy palpation. So when we're scanning for the ATFL, that would be the black uh, portion that we're seeing on that image. And if we just slide down very um, minimally, really, we will get the bifurcate ligament portion. So again, you can see how close they are. And this is a normal bifurcate ligament. Um, this is very unusual that you'd get um, both portions on there, but we did on this particular case. Another example of a normal ligament. And then we have an injury. This is an avulsion injury at the calcaneo navicular uh, portion of the ligament, and then we have the ligament which is irregular and heterogeneous, and the it has pulled a little bit of the uh, calcaneus off. So the implications for bifurcate ligament injuries, they're regularly referred as ATFL uh, injuries. The sonographers or the clinician scans the ATFL, finds that that's normal, and reports a normal scan, and so these ligament injuries are regularly missed. X-ray can miss the avulsion fracture because the avulsion fractures are quite small. Remember, smaller than one millimeter in uh, width or in depth. Uh, and these are very, very common again with plantar flexion, uh, inversion injuries. Basketball players, where they go up for, for a jump shot, they come down, they land on the opponent's foot uh, in a plantar flexed, they invert, uh, and the ligament is sprained. The posterior lateral joint becoming increasingly more interesting to me. So the area that we're interested in looking at here is the posterior talofibular ligament uh, and the adjacent area around that. Now, a lot of people say that you don't see this ligament in ultrasound, but you do see this ligament if it is sprained. So maybe you don't see it very well when it's in the normal uh, appearance when it's not sprained, but when it is sprained, do you see this? And there are some very, very important implications to this ligament being sprained. So this is the position that we're going to scan our probe. So it's in the posterior lower malleolus. Again, you slide up from the CFL position and you get this ligament. Now the ligament is a triangular shaped. This is it here triangular shape, so thicker under the lateral malleolus uh, rather than at the uh, talus end. And you can see in this example, you can see that nice fine fibrillar echo pattern, like fine hairs, I almost call them, laid down. If you if you look at the, the back of a short hair, like a Labrador dog, and you look at the way that their hair is, it's almost that's what a, lig a ligament looks like. Next time you see a black lab, have a look. If you look down at the hair on a, on a black lab, it, um, it has this appearance here, uh, and that's what we call fibrillar echo pattern. 
And when it is swollen, the left, you can see it's th it's thicker. Now, PTFL, what are the implications? This is very, very important. Postrelateral pain is often referred to as Achilles pain. So these are the patients that have come in, they've sprained their ankle, and maybe two or three weeks later, they develop postrelateral pain just in the uh, Achilles recess. And so therapists, doctors, physicians will send them off for a scan saying, query Achilles. Now, the very, um, very good sonographer will scan the Achilles, which will be normal, and report back a normal scan. What's going on? Um, and so the PTFL is involved. Posterior impingement. This is a common cause for posterior impingement. And in fact, the posterior thrust technique for testing this, they'll jump through the roof. So if you think about the Achilles tendon, if it's injured, when you stretch the Achilles tendon, there will be pain. Uh, in this case of the PTFL, if you take the pressure off the Achilles and you place your hand on the calcaneum and just give a little thrust, a gentle thrust, uh, you'll feel that the, the end joint feel, these people will be painful. Uh, and they have finger point tenderness. What do I mean by finger point? They can take their finger and they can point to the tenderness and where they're sore. And again, the posterior thrust is positive. This then also brings us to posterior cysts in a very similar area. Um, and these are called pseudotumors. Uh, and don't be scared of cysts, right? We have Baker cysts, we have dorsal ganglion cysts, we have meniscal cysts. So these are situated adjacent to the posterior talofibular ligament. And again, the position for scanning these is very, very similar. And what we see, right and left, you can see there is these little cysts that sometimes appear. They're not there every time. I would estimate that when I scan a reasonably high grade, a moderate to high grade, thinking back, back to our grading system, a moderate to high grade ankle sprain, 10% will have posterior cysts. And again, the implications. These are responsible for a long and a prolonged recovery. When everything about the ankle looks good, you've got good strength, you've got proprioceptive exercises, uh, good, but the patient comes back to you and just says, for some reason, I'm just aching. I'm aching uh, towards the end of games or towards the end of a, a race, towards the end of an activity. And when I finish my sporting activity or whatever activity I've got, a long walk, I sit down and the back of my ankle aches. Uh, again, the posterior lateral pain may be referred to as Achilles pain. And as said previously, what you'll do is the uh, physician will send the referral along. They will scan the Achilles, which looks completely normal. Uh, the patient goes away scratching their head saying, wow, it, it must be in my head. Maybe I need to see a psychiatrist. No, they don't. They just need to get a proper scan. Posterior cysts are responsible for posterior impingement. Again, they have finger point tenderness. The patient can, can point directly to the point. If you don't scan there, uh, you, you're missing out. Um, always scan any area where the patient comes in and points and says, that's where I am sore. And the posterior thrust is a handy test. It's not unequivocal. Um, it's not always there, but don't forget, if you haven't got a posterior cyst, we need to look at, is the PTFL affected? Mm, the spring ligament, the medial spring lig ligament. So if we have a look at the uh, spring ligament, uh, inside of the, um, the, the foot, and there are several portions to this. Calcaneovicular uh, ligament uh, is the main portion that we see. And this is the position, the black uh, rectangle there is the position for scanning the uh, spring ligament. And that's what it looks like, a normal one. Okay, so three uh, ligament complex, the superior medial uh, calcaneovicular 
ligament is the one that we see mostly. The implications, these are often mistaken for plantar fascia. We need to check for pronation. This is quite uh, commonly seen in tibialis posterior insufficiency syndrome. So where people are over pronating uh, and they can sprain this ligament. Just uh, as a little bit of an aside, not really the ankle, but we're going to talk about plantaris as well in here, often missed. Um, when you're scanning plantaris, come from the Achilles tendon, you'll often see a, a thickened band on the medial side of the Achilles tendon. Follow that up into the uh, aponeurosis of the medial gastrocnemius and soleus, and chronic sprains and, uh, sorry, chronic strains, ligament sprain, tendons and muscles strain. So chronic strains or partial ruptures or, in fact, uh, complete ruptures that have healed, uh, they will present as a thick band that is palpable on the medial side of the calf. And so these are very interesting to have a look at as well. So there we go. This is a thickened plantaris. A couple of references there. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, getting some um, questions via the POCUS team. Thanks very much.